wonderful work that probably is saving. There we go. So we're recording this and more people are entering. So um, obviously all of you who are here obviously got uh, the invitation and what you also saw in the invitation was a series of uh, other material. So first of all, what I gave you is a um, is uh, the pool of of potential questions that can appear on the final exam. And if you look at it there, it adds up to 105 points. So there would be, uh, I gave you three 20 point questions uh, of which uh, 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 two of the three will be chosen. Then I think I gave you um, four of the uh, uh, part two questions of which, uh, or 15 point questions of which uh, three would be chosen. And then there were three questions that were 10 points each of which two will be chosen. So that comes out to 105 points. So you start off with five free points uh, on, that, on, that, um, on that part. Uh, obviously, the exact those questions are going to be asked on the final. So, if you want to spend this next week answering each and every one of the questions and doing that, and then when uh, it opens with the set of questions, you just load it on and you basically finished. Uh, what that also does is for me, guarantee that you did uh, the work on all of those all of those areas. So that would be uh, uh, that would be just a very, very good open book review of um, whatever you're doing. okay? So uh, you have the questions. Uh, if uh, people have questions about the questions, uh, uh, you can write me, and then very often, if I find that uh, the thing is uh, important enough to uh, clarify, I'll clarify it for everybody, because my usual experience has been that whenever one person has a question, a number of others either have the same question but didn't ask or uh, looked at the question uh, uh, looked at the question and said, "Oh yeah, I don't know that either." So anyway, that's uh, uh, it's a uh, it's a beneficial thing. A, a, a large number of you now have uh, corresponded with me with respect to the paper, and if you get the message, uh, uh, "This is fine and good luck," uh, go and proceed. Okay. Uh, for some of you, I made some further uh, comments and suggestions. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, good luck with that. And of course, you can work on that uh, uh, during this week if you haven't finished it already. Uh, okay, so now we get to um, the part one, which again, is just like the part one of the first exam, except, except now it has 100 questions. And I, you notice that those um, part one questions come from four different sources. 40 of the questions are gonna come from the slides that you can find on the lectures in the mid, in the medulla, pons, and midbrain. And in the email, I literally went to each one of those slides and pointed them out for you. Then another 40 questions come from the coronal sections uh, that we started last week and we'll finish today. Then 20 of the questions are gonna, uh, excuse me, 15 of the questions are gonna come from the horizontal sections that I covered today. And then uh, five of the questions 
will come from the sagittal sections, uh, which I'm going to basically cover today. So those are, that would be the 100 points of part one. Now, what I've also uh, begun to do, and I have uh, every hope and intention to absolutely finish. Oh, no, uh, uh, I want, uh, I want uh, uh, everything that you communicate with, with me, um, I want uh, sent by email and sent uh, via a Word file. Uh, of course, all your part one things will do right there and I'll be uh, tabulating your scores. Obviously, uh, doing uh, the paper, you do that on a, um, a, 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 in a Word file. So all of those things um, are things that we uh, need, uh, uh, need to do. I just find the whole thing with, um, with, uh, with, uh, a uh, blackboard is sometimes it runs into glitches and uh, and I have a harder time recovering it. Here, I get your thing, I acknowledge I got the thing and then I answer you back. And I have, uh, I have the thing all sort of worked out for that. Okay, so, um, but uh, the point is all of the material that would be covered for part one will happen will happen by the end of today's lecture. So what I basically did is uh, given that my life as an EO and doing other kinds of things take up time, I basically went through uh, the uh, uh, the uh, all of the weeks of uh, next week, the week uh, and then the week after. And um, I, have uh, basically uh, identified 36 slots um, where I can give the exam. And when I give the exam, I will give it um, in an, uh, a block of an hour and 15 minutes. What I found is that uh, for the first exam, 98% uh, of you finished the exam in less than half an hour for the 40 questions. Here with 100 questions, uh, you'll be given an hour and 15 minutes, okay? And I think we should be able to uh, finish things there. Um, if there is an issue, I would of course reschedule and we would uh, uh, work it out. So you're not limited to the hour and 15 minutes. I'm just anticipating that the vast majority, if not all of you, will finish it within that period of time. Okay, so that's that's what we'll be doing there, and I'll be sending out the um, I'll be sending out the grid of uh, what are the available times, and then what I would want people to be basically doing is signing themselves in. Uh, what I would ask you to do, given that there's a uh, 35 of you is to um, give a uh, give a uh, a priority. I will ask you for your uh, top four slots. I'm hoping that in most of the cases I'll be able to be giving you your first or first two slots. Okay. So that's uh, that's what we're doing uh, with respect to uh, these things. So let's see, we have some chats here. Okay, no, uh, I, I think I've uh, covered those things. Uh, Dr. Bogner, I have a quick question. Um, yep. For the slides, um, so basically for the exam, we basically have to cover everything up to, well, not everything, but like from lectures five to 15, because I noticed we never covered yeah. 16 and, and 17. And 16 so and 17 just... do not have any part part one slides. They will have uh, okay. uh, uh, implications for part two, but they're pretty straightforward. I mean, if, if you look at, if you okay. look at my question on the, uh, on the cortex, uh, uh, you're going to be able to answer uh, the things just by looking at the PowerPoint. 
uh, you wouldn't even need me to be talking there, okay? Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, you'll see that, and you will not be asked to hand in part two until probably, probably not until the 18th of uh, December. So you'll have plenty of time, okay? And it's just because of all of the crazy kind of thing uh, where I missed that lecture because of a power outage and everything like that. So I think we should be able to um, uh, uh, do that well. But what I'm saying is anything that is germane to part one will have been covered by the end of today's class. Okay, good. Any other questions? Uh, can I ask about the essay? Can you ask about the what? Uh, the term paper? Oh, yeah, go ahead. So are we allowed to give our own input on the studies, like maybe for a sentence or two, like mention the limitations that we may have found? Of course. Uh, in fact, yo, that would be that would be uh, very interesting at the end of your at the end of the uh, at the end of the paper, uh, uh, yo where I basically said, think of the first half page to full page as an intro, the, uh, the last half page to full page as a discussion, and the middle three pages summarizing the, the five papers um, or summarizing all the salient results. So obviously in that last general part, uh, you can talk about the limitations, you can talk about your opinion of the papers, you can talk about future directions, anything like that, of course. Okay? Thank you very much. Good. Okay, so here when we were going through the coronal sections, what we um, uh, quickly saw, obviously, in the most rostral of the coronal sections, uh, uh, coronal section one, uh, we don't even see the lateral ventricles yet. We really are seeing uh, uh, the, uh, the very, very rostral part of the frontal lobe. So we're basically, again, seeing the um, interhemispheric fissure not only on the superior surface of the brain, but of course uh, you would see it on the inferior surface of the brain. And uh, so I've, I've identified this and now we go to number two. And now all of a sudden as we're moving quarterly, we're uh, all of a sudden starting to pick up a bunch of the um, uh, uh, structures that we've been talking about not only cortical structures, but of course, uh, very importantly, uh, subcortical structures and the subcortical structures that we, of, of course, are seeing here are uh, the beginnings of the basal ganglia. And then uh, what you're also now seeing is that very important landmark of looking at uh, the lateral ventricles. So and now, what you can see, and this is sort of why I stress this crazy stuff, it might seem like I'm asking you to me memorize minutiae, but I have a method to my madness. And it's because that when you see in the frontal lobe and you're now looking at the lateral, just calling them the lateral ventricles, it's much more accurate to call them the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle that has that sort of very horn-like shape that, uh, and, and uh, you can basically really begin to identify a whole series of structures like the corpus callosum above it. And of course, in the tradition of Mary had a little lamb, the chordate nucleus just lateral to it. Now also in this section, we are not just uh, taken up with um, the frontal lobe, but now all of a sudden we have gotten, we see the emergence of the lateral sulcus and we see 
and emerging rostral part of the temporal lobe. So we're really starting to get um, a particular areas of the brain. Then of course, by number three, we now have gone through a whole bunch of telencephalic structures. So not only now do we see that uh, beautiful anterior horn of the lateral ventricle, we can now see the corpus callosum as being the ceiling of that. You see the uh, chordate, still the, uh, the head of the chordate there. And, but now we start to see the beginnings of other striatal structures. So one major striatal structure that we're seeing here in C3 is what? The chordate and the putamen. And uh, you've already, uh, let me, you already uh, know about the chordate and putamen um, as being um, uh, the neostriatum. And it's called the neostriatum because of their cytoarchitectural similarities. But the whole point of when we looked at the basal ganglia and looked at the chordate and putamen and globus pallidus, we saw that the neostriatum was defined as the, as the chordate and putamen based on cytoarchitecture, whereas the putamen and globus pallidus were, uh, were um, lumped together as the lenticular nuclei um, as a function of location. And of course, that thing that, make, that demarcates the location, of course, is the emerging um, anterior limb of the internal capsule because what the anterior limb of the internal capsule does is it separates the chordate from the putamen. And as we go caudally, it'll separate the chordate from the globus pallidus, but also put the, port, uh, the, the putamen and globus pallidus on the lateral edge of that uh, in, uh, internal capsule. What we now also see in C3 again, just like we saw in C1 and C2, is nicely demarcated superior middle and uh, inferior frontal gyri, but different for C3, we are now starting to see the superior middle and inferior temporal gyri. So, but what we still see in C1, C2, and C3 is real good idea that you're you're very much in the uh, rostral part of the frontal lobe. Why? Because you're seeing the interhemispheric fissure both on the superior surface and the inferior surface. Then we move to uh, four and now something really changes. Now what we know is that uh, we are no longer in that rostral part of the frontal lobe and the reason why we're not uh, 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 in that uh, a full frontal lobe is because we don't have this uh, interhemispheric fissure on the superior and inferior surfaces. So we lose that structure like the transverse gyrus. Instead, what we now have is what we, when we went back into brain reorganization, is when we started to define the diencephalon and how we could separate the diencephalon from the telencephalon. And the rostral border of the diencephalon was the optic chiasm, which of course we see here, okay? So we see here. And uh, so now we know we're going into uh, eventually diencephalic structures. The other thing that we're basically saying is that we know that there are two major aspects of interhemispheric communication. There's the corpus callosum, but now what you can see is the anterior commissure. So we know we've now moved a bit more quarterly and start to see these structures and you identify it. You still have a very clear 
anterior horn of the lateral ventricle. But now in C4, we now have the full complement of what we call the basal ganglia structures. The basal ganglia or corpus callosum is made up of the chordate, the putamen, and the globus pallidus. And we can see the chordate and the putamen, otherwise known as the neostriatum, separated by a very clear internal capsule. And now what we can see lateral to the internal capsule, sort of in this Thanksgiving pie type of shape right here, you know, two pieces of uh, pumpkin pie right there. You can basically see the putamen, and then you can see the zona externa and the zona interna of the, of the globus pallidus. And we take those lateral uh, striatal structures and give them the name of the lenticular nuclei. Now, both in C3 and C4, not only do we see striatal structures, but we see extra striatal structures. So what we were also uh, able to see uh, where we could uh, basically look at the um, look at the uh, 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 the striatum uh, uh, from the function of uh, coming out of the, uh, the lateral ventricle and going laterally. That what we saw is the lateral ventricle, and then we see the chordate, and then lateral to that is the internal capsule. Then lateral to that is the putamen and globus pallidus. Then lateral to that is the external capsule. And then lateral, lateral to that is another extra striatal structure called the claustrum with its sort of boomerang type of shape. Then lateral to that is the extreme capsule. And then finally lateral to that we now start to touch on cortical struct, cortical tissue, but that cortical tissue is sort of very, very unique. It's called the insula, and we see the insula is, is there from a, a Roman of like insulation, isolated. That the insula is sort of isolated from the surrounding frontal lobe and temporal lobes simply because. What the lateral sulcus does as it, uh, as it divides the temporal lobe from the frontal lobe is it sort of forms a, a, a snake tongue that, that insulates the insula from the rest of the, of, of the, of the cortex. So what you're basically uh, seeing here is a number of, of uh, is uh, these subcortical structures. The other subcortical structure that you're really starting to see is uh, at C4, is you notice that the septum pellucidum has gotten a bit wider. And why? Because within here at the septum pellucidum, we're gonna have the septal nuclei, the medial and lateral septal nuclei. And then finally, when we're looking in C4 versus C3 and C2, we now start to see a much clearer temporal lobe with a superior temporal gyrus, middle temporal gyrus, inferior temporal gyrus, and then finally, the most medial parahippocampal gyrus. And buried within the parahippocampal gyrus, you're going to basically find a rostral limbic structure that we have talked about at length called the amygdala which we know is made up of a series of nuclei, the basal nuclei, the cortical nuclei, uh, and the central nuclei of the amygdala. So uh, that's what we basically saw in C4 that we went through all in detail uh, last week. And of course, this is a very uh, sort of handy kind of uh, way of bookmarking um, this particular, uh, from around this section and just rostral to it, from roughly C3 all the way out to about C8, that what you can always see in here is the, uh, is the size of the uh, striatum and where the striatum is relative 
to the medial lateral organization. So what's basically going to be happening is as we move quarterly, something else is going to burst into view. As we saw, the diencephalon is starting, and you have the hypothalamus, and then you're going to have the big thalamic nuclei. So those striatal structures are going to be pushed out more laterally as we go quarterly. And also, what else do we uh, do? I, again, try to use analogies all the time, uh, simply because uh, uh, I, I hope they're helpful. Um, and what I would always basically talk to you about is the chordate as a two-tailed tadpole. So, and, and if you just know anything about a tadpole, you know that tadpole has a very widened rostral part of the body that starts to taper and then come down to a tight little tail at the end. Now, I call the chordate a two-tailed tadpole because the, the, um, the uh, head of the chordate is seen largely in the frontal lobe. The body of the chordate is seen largely in the parietal lobe. And then the two tails of the chordate are seen in the occipital lobe and in the temporal lobe. And where do they sit? They sit uh, laterally to um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the inferior and posterior horns of the lateral ventricle. And then you can basically see all of those other structures. So now uh, we are now starting to move into the real busyness of the of the um, of the uh, uh, of the brain, because what you're not only seeing is the telencephalic structures, but now you're seeing quite a number of the diencephalic structures, especially those uh, related to the hypothalamus. So what now has happened? So we now, we have said goodbye to the, on the ventral surface of the brain to the interhemispheric fissure. We've said goodbye to that very strong landmark on the inferior surface of the brain that demarcates the telencephalon from the diencephalon, the optic chiasm. And now what are we basically seeing? What we are now basically seeing is a um, is the uh, not only the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle still has that uh, very horn-like shape, uh, but we now see the emergence of the third ventricle. So, of course, what is basically happening around here of the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle? We're seeing, we're quote, seeing something we don't see because what I'm talking about is a foramen or a hole, the foramen of Monroe, which allows the passage of CSF from the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle to move quarterly. And now what we're also going to start to see is the choroid plexus, um, which are the epithelial cells uh, that produce the CSF that will uh, uh, be on the floor of the lateral ventricles and on the roof of the third ventricle to keep producing CSF. Now, uh, and so, and the way we've always sort of talked about this, especially when we looked at the, um, uh, uh, the lateral ventricles, we usually would see the, um, we see the septum pellucidum as the medial wall, the chordate as the lateral wall, the, um, uh, the corpus callosum as the so-called ceiling. And then in a number of cases, we then will see this other major fiber tract, the fornix um, uh, uh, here. And what we basically see right here is the fornix uh, is identified here and here. So remember, uh, when we looked at the mid-sagittal sections, I basically said, you can see three big Cs. You can see the cingulate gyrus, which of course is always in a lot of these sections right here. You could see 
the corpus callosum. And then what you could see is the fornix. And the fornix makes a C as it comes out of the hippocampus, uh, passes by the AB nucleus of thalamus, and then it plunges where uh, 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 the, uh, the rounded part of the C is the columns of the fornix, where instead of going caudally to rostrally, it is now going superiorly inferiorly, and then it curves caudally again. So what do we see here? We see the fornix here, and we see the fornix here, simply. And so what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that the columns of the fornix was a little bit more rostral to this. And the columns of the fornix, where the columns of the fornix is going this way, we usually see the anterior commissure decussating. Look at where the anterior commissure is now, here and here. And what do I basically uh, analogize the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the anterior commissure, but to either the golden arches or the Jeffersonian arch. I mean, uh, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, which has, the, uh, uh, which has this famous uh, Jeffersonian arch has been called the gateway to the West. As you go across the Mississippi River, you see this big uh, arch and it's a sort of going, you go West young man as how, uh, Horace Greeley would say. But when we look at an arch like this, we have to recognize that the anterior commissure as an arch is not just straight uh, back and forth, but it, it bends forward so that the decussation of the anterior commissure is rostral to where uh, the sources of the anterior commissure are around the amygdaloid nuclei and the entorhinal cortex of the medial temporal lobe. The other thing that we again basically see here that's uh, again important is that uh, now what we're looking at is the optic tract. And what is the optic tract? The optic tract is the part of the, uh, is the, part of the optic system in which um, the uh, uh, optic, uh, past the optic chiasm. So therefore, the difference between an optic nerve and an optic tract is that whereas the optic nerve contains all of the visual information that's going back into the brain from one eye and one eye only, the optic tract, because we've gone through the partial decussation of the optic chiasm has information from the contralateral visual field of both eyes, okay? And that, of course, this optic tract is gonna shoot back into the lateral geniculate body of the thalamus, and we're gonna see it progressing as it's moving back towards that accessory thalamic nucleus. And then the, uh, 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 the cross fibers will synapse on lamina one, four, and six, and the, uh, uh, and the uncrossed fibers will synapse on lamina two, three, and five of the lateral geniculate body, and then uh, uh, second order neurons will then send back things through the optic radiations to the primary visual cortex. So uh, what we see, and uh, again, is C5. So again, in each one of these things, as, as I'm talking, this is another way of how you should be thinking about it. In each section, no matter which direction you're going, what has stayed the same, what has been lost relative to the previous section, and then what has been uh, gained uh, relative to the previous section. Okay, so now we go to coronal number six, and now uh, again, we're looking primarily at um, hypothalamic and uh, hypothalamic and um, 
and striatal structures, but what we're also seeing in, uh, in a coronal six, the real clear thing of properly where the foramen of Monroe would be going, because what do we see? We see the choroid plexus on the, uh, the choroid plexus is on the floor of the lateral ventricles and the roof of the third ventricle. Can you see the fornix? And now what else are you starting to see here? You're starting to see the internal capsule coming uh, uh, coming down, coming uh, more inferiorly. This is uh, still the anterior limb of the internal capsule. And what do we expect that internal capsule or anterior limb to do? Because that's part of the corticos corticospinal tract. We eventually expect it to turn. And we call that turn, that sort of knee-like uh, knee structure, the cru cerebri. And then we will have the corticospinal tract go into the cerebral peduncles in the midbrain. So uh, that's happening. We're seeing we're seeing the um, we're seeing the uh, op uh, optic tract. We still see remnants of the anterior commissure, and uh, we're seeing other structures like the infundibulum, which of course is going to be what. Uh, the axons coming out of the paraventricular and supraoptic nuclei of the hypothalamus and coming down. And those axons will populate the posterior lobe of the pituitary, otherwise known as the neurohypothesis. And this is where um, uh, those, uh, uh, those hormones are released into the blood, like vasopressin, oxytocin, Etc. So we've uh, gone through uh, this slide, and now we come to number seven. And now, finally, in number seven, we now start to see some of our uh, uh, the other aspect of the um, diencephalon, and that is the thalamus. So what you can see in the thalamus is some. Um, of the uh, more lateral thalamic nuclei and medial thalamic nuclei. And you can see the internal capsule almost reaching the, um, the inferior surface. And you can see the optic tract going in the opposite direction. You also now can see how the fornix really separates because we are now coming into that part of the uh, hypothalamus, which is the caudal part of the hypothalamus. And uh, what you would expect on the inferior surface at the caudal part of the hypothalamus is what? The mammillary bodies. And that is where the fornix uh, very often uh, terminates, a, a, a portion of the fornix terminates. What we're also seeing here uh, now, whereas in C4 and C5, we saw a sort of vague area in the medial temporal lobe that I just identified for you as being the amygdaloid nuclei. They don't stand out. But now, when as we move a bit more quarterly, we're now seeing another limbic nucleus, which is definitely embedded within the medial temporal lobe. And that has a very distinctive characteristic. And of course, what that is, is the hippocampus. And we see the hippocampus in terms of, um, uh, 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 in, in two different ways. One way, what we can see is six different cellular layers of the hippocampus that are uh, not six cellular layers, but six layers that literally define where the inputs are coming in, with layers one and two combined as being the subiculum, and even layer six having some inputs coming in. And then uh, uh, the major uh, uh, place for the outputs of the hippocampus are in layer four. Uh, so those pyramidal cells of the hippocampus. So uh, we can see that. And then 
What we also know is that the hippocampus was so named because of its distinctive seahorse type of shape. So what you have is not only uh, 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 not only the, uh, the six layers, but you have the six layers that move along this sort of seahorse type of shape, whereas the, uh, the, uh, the dorsal layer is CA1, uh, the curve is CA2, the ventral layer is CA3, and then the dentate is uh, the fourth. And of course, CA stands for what? A cornu ammonis, which are Ammon's horns, which is where the hippocampus uh, got its name. So now we are at uh, 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 coronal eight, and I think I was finishing this off in, from the last class. And so what we can basically do here is start to identify uh, some important types of structures. So one thing that we have right here that I wanna call your attention to, and I talked about this uh, when we talked about the thalamic nuclei, is sort of the distinctive way that the AV nucleus, the anterior ventral nucleus of the thalamus is situated. And we're gonna see this not only clearly here, but we're gonna see this in the horizontal sections. That is, um, remember that the AV nucleus is projecting its fibers out that will eventually go up to the cingular gyrus. Big band of fibers. In addition, the uh, AV nucleus has two major inputs. Right here, you can see it sitting right adjacent to the fornix. And the other major input to the AV nucleus of thalamus is the mammalothalamic tract that you can see right here. The mammalothalamic tract is coming out of the mammillary bodies and going up to the AB nucleus of thalamus. So uh, sort of in this picture, again, my analogy is the Statue of Liberty where Statue of Liberty is holding the torch. And you basically think of the arm of the Statue of Liberty and uh, uh, as the mammalothalamic tract, the hand of the Statue of Liberty of both the outgoing and incoming fiber, fibers into the AV nucleus of thalamus from the mammalothalamic tract and from the fornix. And then the torch is the nucleus itself. And we're gonna be basically seeing this when we're looking at uh, uh, coronal sections. So we again see uh, the mammillary bodies there and we can see right above it uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, the fornix. Now, what else? Notice what's happening to the third ventricle. The third ventricle seems to be getting smaller. Remember, it had that vertical alignment and uh, uh, separated the two hypothalami. Well, what is going to happen to the third ventricle as we move cordially? It's eventually going to turn into the cerebral aqueduct. To do that, it has to get smaller. And as it moves cordially, it has to start to move uh, superiorly. Because when we look at the, when we look at the uh, cerebral aqueduct, we're basically seeing the cerebral aqueduct separating uh, the uh, midbrain below it that we call tegmentum and the midbrain above it that we call tectum. Okay, so again, what, what do we still see here? We still see we are now starting to move very clearly into sort of the body of the lateral ventricles. And we see a much smaller chordate nucleus, the body of the chordate. And this is not surprising because if we look out here on out, uh, out here, uh, what we are seeing is precentral gyrus, central sulcus or Rolandic fissure, 
and then we're seeing post-central gyrus. So we're literally moving at the place between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. So we see the dorsomedial uh, thalamic nuclei, the AV, mammalothalamic tract, and then we see more lateral beginning things like uh, VPL thalamus and VL thalamus, that would be hard to tell. But we uh, again see the body of the chordate. We then see the, uh, the uh, uh, internal capsule. But now what are we seeing? Not only the anterior um, limb of the internal capsule, but of course the posterior limb. And what would be a major contributor of the posterior limb? It would be the medial lemniscus, which of course, as we know, is a midbrain structure. And that, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, medial lemniscus is gonna be sending the fibers up to the VPL thalamus. And then the VPL thalamus will use the posterior limb of the internal capsule to uh, innovate the, um, uh, the post-central gyrus. Now, what else do we then see? We're seeing this is starting to turn. So we're gonna be starting to form the cruz cerebri, which would eventually form the what? The cerebral peduncle. And we know that at this turn, the medial lemniscal fibers are entering into the VPL thalamus. So now lateral to this, we have the putamen, which again is much smaller size now. And then we can see the clearly defined zona externa of the globus pallidus and the zona interna of the globus pallidus. So now if we turn our, uh, so then what can you do is if you're looking at the putamen, lateral to that, you still can see the external capsule. You still can see that extra striatal structure, the claustrum. You still can see a very narrow extreme capsule. And now what you can see is a well-defined insula. Well-defined insula, extreme capsule, claustrum, external capsule, putamen. So now if we turn our attention to the temporal lobe, what else do we have here? We have now a far more defined hippocampus. So I went through this in the last class. So now we go to coronal section number nine. And in coronal section number nine, certain kinds of things are continuing to change. So what we have is we still have the dorsal surface of the, uh, of the fornix. We have the ventral part of the fornix with now quite clear mammillary bodies. What we still have is the mammalothalamic tract going up to the AV nucleus of thalamus. We have the dorsomedial nucleus of thalamus. We now have the, um, uh, 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 the uh, VPL and lateral uh, nuclei of the thalamus here and here. And we have both the, the uh, uh, anterior limb of the internal capsule going to begin to form the cerebral peduncles and the, um, the medial lemniscus is going to be feeding into the posterior limb. Then what we see laterally is a much smaller putamen, still a small, uh, uh, still a small uh, chordate. And then we have the zona externa and the zona interna of the median eminence, uh, of the globus pallidus. 
zona externa and zona interna. We have the clearly defined um, uh, hippocampus. And so now what else is strange here? Well, so what we're doing is we're cutting. Um, we're now getting to a point where if you remember when I uh, talked about the brain way back at the very first thing, we talk about what we call a horizontal uh, axis and a vertical axis. We're missing a whole portion here. So as you're cutting through here, look at what starts to happen. You cut and then you have space and then here. So here you have space. So what you're actually cutting down here is you're actually skipping now down into pons and medulla and even maybe part of, hip, uh, of cerebellum. You can't really tell that very, very clearly. But in any case, uh, things start to get a little tricky and the whole purpose of a coronal section uh, starts to, uh, remember, how do we define a coronal section? A coronal section is sections that are uh, uh, parallel to uh, 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 superior, inferior, parallel uh, to medial lateral, but then perpendicular to uh, rostral caudal. But when we start to hit here, and we start to cut a core, we start to automatically cut across an oblique, which is not a, a coronal section. And that really comes out when we look at number 10. So what we're going to do here is look at number 10. And I'm going to tell you that all of a sudden, we see things twice. The thing we see twice here is part of the ventricular system here and part of the ventricular system here. So what you're basically seeing here is a very remnant of the very caudal part of the third ventricle. Whereas what you're seeing here is you're starting, you're basically seeing a, um, you're seeing a, 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 a cerebral aqueduct. So look at this, so now, but what we're doing uh, is um, something very interesting. Remember, I started teaching this course in 1979. I'm now teaching this course in 2020. So there was a, a decade in American history uh, that was known as the gay 90s. Now, I, I, I don't wanna get into political or things here, but the gay 90s, when uh, people were talking about the 1890s and they called it the gay 90s, I do not think they were talking very much about sexual orientation. They were using uh, uh, the word gay as an adjective, as euphoric, a forward looking, open, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, obviously the 1990s was a very, very important decade in the era, uh, uh, era of, uh, of gay history, but I'm thinking of uh, the 1890s. So, what I want you to do is just imagine uh, people going to the beach in the 1890s. And they would do that simply because there were more and more uh, uh, trolley cars and everything like that, that took the area around Brooklyn and the beaches around Brooklyn and then further out into Queens and made these things more accessible. So people would go out to uh, uh, the, uh, the beach. Now, in New York City history, what you also had um, were things uh, that they focused on uh, uh, for, in Europe uh, all the way back in the 1850s, which they basically called pleasure palaces. 
And pleasure palaces were these big cavernous like structures in which crowds of people could go and mingle and socialize and be entertained. So in the 1850s, the sort of pleasure palace that was uh, uh, created was created in what would be uh, uh, in today's Manhattan around the uh, uh, around somewhere between 50th Street and 60th Street. You have to understand that still 80% of the population of Manhattan lived below Houston Street in all of the lower, the lower east side and the lower west side. So people would venture up there. Now, who was the great entrepreneur of this pleasure palace? And that, uh, that entrepreneur was P.T. Barnum. So if there were those of you who have never heard of P.T. Barnum, go and, um, uh, go and Google him. But those who do know that P.T. Barnum had a particular saying. There's a sucker born every minute. What he always wanted to do is separate uh, people from their money by showing them garish things. Well, the P.T. Barnum and the Pleasure Palaces of the 1850s, by 1890, it moved out to the outskirts of Brooklyn and then formed an equally uh, interesting thing of New York and even American history. It was called Coney Island. And in Coney Island, you would have rides, you would have uh, uh, events, you would have uh, literal 365 day a year circuses and everything like that. And uh, people would flock out there. They'd also flock out there to get uh, to a beach. So uh, uh, women would wear uh, a, a sort of big uh, one piece bathing suit that did not reveal very much about them. And men, very often the typical bathing suit that they wore would be, they would have a, a strap and then they would have like a shirt and the shirt would be uh, uh, connected right into uh, 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 shorts. So it was a one piece suit. Now, of course, if a man had to relieve himself, hopefully he'd go to a bathroom, but what he could do is he could work uh, by uh, 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 taking the uh, uh, move, uh, displacing part of the bathing suit if he had to urinate. However, if he had to defecate, that was another bigger problem. And so what these, these uh, bathing suits had is in the back, they had two buttons. So you had two buttons and what you could do is unbutton the buttons and a flap would fall down so the person could go and defecate, okay? Then they pull the flap back up. So what I'm very interested, I know this is a very long story, what I'm very interested in, in telling you is about that flap. Because when you think about a flap, here is the intersection at which the thing flaps. So. Uh, so here, think about this as the as the um, as the uh, 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 hypothalamus, and then at the curve of the flap, you flap down, and now you have a midbrain, and that's how it's cut in coronal section. So, what you actually see is the very caudal hypothal uh, hypothalamus and thalamic area right here is sort of superior to inferior. Yet what we have right here from here going down is we now have the midbrain as if that 1890s flap flapped over and turned around. So what I'm asking you to see, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump ahead because, oh, no, this is the last one. Um, what you're basically doing is looking at an embedded figure here. Basically, you see where I'm starting. I'm going like this, I'm going like this, I'm going like this, I'm coming around like this, and I'm coming here. 
everything within this sort of little circle is the midbrain, the mesencephalon, except we usually look at the mesencephalon as this being superior and this is being uh, 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 superior and inferior. It's an inverse thing because what we have right here is the cerebral peduncle. What we have right here is a very, very distinctive uh, uh, cellular structure that we learned about, the substantia nigra. In fact, that's the pars compacta, and here's the pars reticulata. Then what we have in here in our keyhole is the periaqueductal gray. And then we have the cerebral aqueduct. So what we can see, and if we keep going further and further back, as we get back into the occipital lobe, there is so much versus the rostral part of the coronal sections, there was nothing else there. When you get to the caudal part of the coronal sections, you're now looking at a whole bunch of oblique sections. So you can then see behind it, you're now uh, cutting into uh, reticular formation of the pons and medulla below it. So uh, this is the last section that we're basically looking at with C10. So let me. So uh, a, a very important kind of thing when we're looking at this. You can see C9 and C10 has some information to it. You also can see that C1 and C2 have some information to it. But the areas of the coronal section that end up giving you the greatest amount of information of integrating all of the things that we have learned really go between C3 and C8. So what's basically going to happen on this final exam, when I ask you the 40 questions, I'm basically going to be taking the vast bulk of those questions from C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, and C8. So what you can basically assume is that there will be 40 unique questions coming out of uh, C3 to C8. I'm not going to ask you, identify the uh, chordate here and identify the chordate there. I'm going to, you obviously can realize I have what? Probably 80, 90 structures I've identified, and I'm going to ask you about 40 of them. Does anybody have any? questions about the coronal sections. Okay. So now, so now what we're going to do is going to horizontal sections. And of course, you've already gotten the first horizontal section a long, long, long time ago, way back in September. The very first part of the brain that I showed you was the superior surface of the brain. So now, and then if you remember in lecture number one, what I had, uh, in the very, very first slide is some, um, is two pictures of, um, of, 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 from movies. One of them was from the movie uh, Hannibal, which was the sequel to Silence of the Lambs, in which you had uh, this insane psychiatrist who ate human flesh and whatever, uh, and uh, what he has done in this movie is removed the upper part of the skull 
and expose the superior surface of the brain. And he's about to cut off pieces of the brain and saute it and feed it to this guy. Really wild movie. But so what you basically know is that as you're doing these horizontal cuts, you're going more, you're starting superior and moving more and more inferior. So this is why I suggest to you both studying, uh, studying now, but knowing afterwards that when you're looking at horizontal sections, have a representative coronal section, probably somewhere between C3 and C8, so that you can basically look on the coronal section and identify at what level the corresponding horizontal section is at. So here we're gonna be looking at, again, horizontal one, we're very close to the superior surface. So there's not that many other kinds of things that we're gonna identify here, but uh, 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 as we move in and move more and more inferiorly, we'll get far more information. So let's look at horizontal one. So obviously, number one and number 16 are pointing to the interhemispheric fissure. And the interhemispheric fissure, of course, sitting above it is the superior surface. So we see the interhemispheric fissure at the frontal pole and in, and at the occipital pole, the occipital pole and in. Then always importantly, another interesting structure that we can identify is number two, which is the cingulate gyrus, okay? And what we knew from the cingulate gyrus is that the cingulate gyrus um, is, uh, uh, is shaped like a C. It, uh, it, 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 uh, it goes down at the frontal, uh, uh, in the frontal pole, and then sort of covers um, uh, uh, the uh, gyri around the interhemispheric fissure. But notice, we don't see an interhemispheric fissure uh, right through here simply because we've cut this cut is too low. So therefore, the cingular gyrus, which started out here, is uh, cut off and we don't see this. So what do we actually do see? What we actually do see, of course, is the corpus callosum. And we uh, number five, you see the corpus callosum. And then what we know from the corpus callosum is that we have a rostrum of the corpus callosum, and then we have uh, the genu of the corpus callosum. And notice that how what's beautiful about this sort of uh, picture is ba basically showing you how the corpus callosum is gathering enormous amounts of material from where the surrounding corona radiata. So if you remembered, if we, were, if we were cutting up here around C1, we wouldn't be seeing lateral ventricles or anything, but we saw a big corona radiata. You can see the corona radiata gets pushed more laterally as we go wider. Also in the corona radiata, you not only have colossal fibers that cross the midbrain, but you also have um, uh, 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 ipsilateral fibers that are connecting all of the um, all of the uh, you're connecting all of the uh, 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 cortical areas uh, among the occipital lobe, the uh, the parietal lobe, and the frontal lobe. Okay, uh, so let's see what else we have here. So to identify where we are, and you can see this takes quite a bit of thing. Number six here is the, is the uh, precentral sulcus. 
So everything rostral to this, what we're looking along here is superior frontal gyrus. And this is the precentral sulcus. So then number eight is the central sulcus. So if this is the central sulcus and this is the precentral sulcus, here is the precentral gyrus or motor cortex. Here is the postcentral gyrus or somatosensory cortex. And then number 10 is the postcentral gyrus, postcentral sulcus that separates the postcentral gyrus from uh, the either superior or inferior parietal lobule. Then another important sulcus that you can see here is number 15. And here is the calcarine sulcus in the occipital lobe uh, upon which is bordered the primary visual uh, cortex. And then 22 is the superior parietal lobule that you can basically see there. And then finally, finally, 23 and 27, in 23 here, we can see the body of the chordate. And here, 27, we can see the head of the chordate because what do we have? We have an emerging lateral ventricle what, what will be an emerging anterior horn and here a body, okay? So now we go, we come down a little bit further and now hopefully we're now gonna start to see a bunch of structures. And of course, again, sort of like as we went rostral cordal, other than a cortical structure, the first kind of structures we mo move superior and inferior is the identification of the um, uh, of the uh, uh, of the uh, striatal structures. So again, in H two, we have the frontal pole in the interhemispheric fissure the occipital pole in its hemispheric fissure. Now what we can see is the rostrum of the corpus callosum. And then with number 14, we can see the splenium of the corpus callosum. Okay, so you can see the rostrum is getting uh, by and large uh, a frontal input from the corona radiata, whereas the splenium is getting input from the parietal and occipital portions of the corona radiata. Okay, then number five, right here is the beginning of the separation of the uh, uh, internal capsule. So we're going to have an anterior limb of the internal capsule, and we're going to have a posterior limb of the internal capsule, right? Because we're looking uh, rostrocordally on this horizontal section. So we have the lateral ventricle, and we can see far more here, the um, anterior horn of the lateral ventricle here we can see the posterior horn, the lateral ventricle. Let's go back. Here we saw the body, but the body of course sort of disappears as we go inferiorly. So if you remember here, we see the roof of the lateral ventricles with the corpus callosum and the lateral ventricle itself so now when we start to think of the lateral ventricles uh, and we see the anterior horn 
and posterior horn, we no longer see the body, but what do we see? We see the floor of that lateral body of the lateral ventricle, which is made up of what? Here is the fornix. You can see the fornix, uh, the vast majority of the fibers of the fornix are running out of the hippocampus and going forward, a small minority of the fibers will be coming from the septum and doing the septohippocampal pathway back to uh, the hippocampus. So now we see with the internal capsule, now what we can do is we can, uh, uh, if we see the chordate here, and we have an internal capsule. So what's lateral to the internal capsule? The putamen here and here. Do we see a globus pallidus? Of course not, because the globus pallidus, as you know, is, is inferior to the uh, inferior and medial to the putamen. And therefore you can't see it on this horizontal section. But what you see very nicely is that is this septum, lateral, lateral ventricles, chordate, internal capsule, putamen, external capsule, claustrum, extreme capsule, insula, septum, chordate, internal capsule, putamen, external capsule, claustrum, extreme capsule, insula. And look how that insula is separated, uh, really isolated from the other, what we call classic cortical lobes in the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, uh, uh, occipital lobe, etc. Okay. So again, 17, right here, again, is the calcarine sulcus. So you see that much nicer on a horizontal section. And then what you also see here is notice, this is the fornix. Notice how the fornix is splayed. And the reason it's splayed is because this part of the fornix is actually the fan-like shape of the fibers called the fimbria, where the fimbria is getting output from layer six of all four areas of the hippocampus, the alveus, to come out and make that fan-like shaped fimbria that tightens into a bundle uh, called the fornix. Okay. So now what we're also able in a very, very general way is uh, when we're looking uh, here, we are also beginning to identify the dorsal tier nuclei of the thalamus. So here with number 23, we have the dorsal medial nucleus of the thalamus. And then with number 28, here is the very beginning of the AV nucleus of the thalamus. Right there, okay. So, so we've gotten considerably more uh, structures in this H2 uh, layer. So now we cut a bit deeper and now we have a, a large uh, number of uh, structures that become uh, a quite a bit clearer. So here, what we can now see 
is we're no longer looking at a corpus callosum. We're no longer looking at a body of a uh, of uh, 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 a body of the uh, lateral ventricle. And we're no longer looking at the um, fornix, which is above this section. Rather, what we, we see with the fornix is two things. Rostrally, we see the columns of the fornix here. And what is the columns of the fornix? It's where the fornix is coming out of the hippocampus, coming forward, past the, uh, uh, the dience, uh, diencephalon, and then it plunges so that it can now make a C-type shape and go back into the mammillary bodies of the hypothalamus. And the columns of the fornix is the curve of the C. So you see the columns of the fornix here. What else do you see of the fornix? What you see right here is this sort of boomerang shaped structure and boomerang shaped structure. What you got right there is the fimbria. Remember that the fornix is a bunch of hippocampal efferents. Yes, and one septal afferent, uh, but, it is, uh, but it comes from all four of Ammon's horns, the dentate CA3, CA2 and CA1 and those fibers are coming out in a splayed way, and then they tighten up to form the fornix. So now, so the, there's no more fornix. So now what should we be looking at? What we should be looking at is we see a very clear internal capsule all the way along here of large numbers of fibers uh, entering up, okay, into uh, 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 into here. And what we basically see is the uh, anterior horn of the lateral ventricle. And of course, lateral to that is the head of the chordate. And then you have the internal capsule. Here's the anterior limb. And then lateral to that, of course, is the putamen. There is the putamen. Then lateral to that is the uh, uh, external capsule. Then lateral to that is the claustrum. Then lateral to that is the extreme capsule. And then you see a very well-formed insula. Again, septum, septum, septum pellucidum, uh, lateral ventricle, Chordate, internal capsule, putamen, external capsule, claustrum, extreme capsule, and then insula. So now, if we know down here, we have the fimbria, and up here we have the columns of the fornix, what big heart-shaped structure should be emerging in here? You know, remember, it's a bit more uh, caudal here because it's caudal to the columns of the fornix. Here is a big diencephalic structure. And of course, that big diencephalic structure is the thalamus. And here, I think, is uh, an extremely clear um, example of how the AV nucleus of the thalamus can stand as a landmark for everything else around it. And it shows how separate it is because you have the AV nucleus of the thalamus here. And then what you also have is um, uh, the uh, intermedullary lamina of the thalamus. So uh, that is right here and then also right here. So you can literally see how by using the word encapsulated, the AV nucleus of thalamus is. Then what you see uh, caudal to that is just as we went through the thala uh, thalamic lecture, here is the dorsal medial nucleus of thalamus. And then what we have are more lateral thalamic nuclei. 
So out here, um, uh, what we have is the sort of um, upper edge of areas like VPL, okay? Okay, so I want to make sure I've covered everybody there. Yep, I think I've covered everything there. So, so everybody sort of sees where we are um, with H3. So let me let me just do something here for a minute. Good. Uh, what I'm going to do right now is uh, give you a short break. And then uh, we'll come back and go through the rest of the horizontal and then we'll go into the sagittals, okay? So take a short break here.
Okay, so now so now we'll move uh, into uh, going uh, deeper and now all of a sudden a bunch of other structures will come into play. So one thing is if you saw before the AV nucleus of thalamus and dorsomedial nuclei of thalamus. So now when we move into horizontal four, we are no longer seeing uh, the AV nucleus of thalamus because we are now below it. So just as we've moved deeper and lost the structure, we have now also gained a structure. And that is now looking at the striatum, what we are now basically seeing is the uh, a, a much larger putamen, but now the zona externa and zona interna of the globus pallidus. So you see the zona externum and zona interna of the globus pallidus. You see the putamen. You no longer see, because we're too now deep, we don't see the chordate. I'm sorry, wait a second. Right, we don't, we don't see the chordate. But what we do again continue to see is that lateral shape of the external capsule, the claustrum, the extreme capsule, and the insula. The zona interna of the globus pallidus, zona externa of the globus pallidus, the putamen, the external capsule, the claustrum, the extreme capsule, and then the insula. So now, what else do we uh, 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 you know, see here? We again see the internal capsule, but notice now the internal capsule is a bit more caudal and it's deeper. And eventually what's gonna to start to happen here, this internal capsule is either gonna become part of what we see as the medial lemniscus as it ascends, or we're gonna see the cerebral peduncle as part of the cortical spine, spinal tract as it descends. Then what we have out in here is the VPL thalamus. So in this area up here, we're going to probably be seeing, although we don't clearly identify it as such, as areas like VA and VL thalamus. This is VPL. Now, as we go into the caudal part of the thalamus with BPL thalamus, what do we now have here is a very large structure, which is an accessory thalamic nucleus, and that is the pulvinar, uh, number 22. Okay. Now, if you remember, we were looking at uh, back here, uh, the, uh, the fimbria. Now what we can see is where the fimbria is coming out of. We have the hippocampus. Okay, so now let's go bring ourselves forward again. Because what we had before in H3 is the lateral ventricles, the anterior horn of the lateral ventricles. And what we had was the columns of the fornix. So now as we go deeper, we still have the columns of the fornix. But we don't have lateral ventricles. What we have instead now, of course, is the third ventricle. 
So there's the third ventricle. And there's the columns of the fornix as they are now going to go deeper and uh, move cordially uh, towards the mammillary bodies. And of course, what we have is with the columns of the fornix, where they are going superior and inferior, what else is going medial laterally? Here is the decussation of the anterior commissure. So we have the decussation of the anterior commissure. And of course, that will now, as we go deeper, move cordally and laterally until it gets out into the medial temporal lobe. Okay. So now, something else. When we are here, we're basically looking in H3, we're looking at uh, frontal lobe structures, parietal lobe structures, and occipital lobe structures. Now in horizontal four, what are we now starting to form in here? Lateral sulcus. And we're gonna again, begin to start to see temporal lobe structures. So now here we go into the uh, uh, horizontal five. We're going deeper. So first of all, remember we had the decussation of the anterior commissure. Now you're starting to see the anterior commissure, uh, both sides of it moving out laterally and moving towards the medial temporal lobe, deep in the medial temporal lobe. We then have the third ventricle and we have periventricular hypothalamic nuclei around that. We then have the, okay, one. We then have caudal thalamic nuclei, still areas of the VPL. And then we have areas of either the cruise cerebri or beginning of cerebral peduncle or internal capsule. Here again is the hippocampus seen better here, but it's also over here. And then as usual, we're now deeper. We have the putamen, the external capsule, the claustrum, the extreme capsule, and the insula on both sides. And here is the, here, with the putamen, here is the globus pallidus. So now we go a bit deeper. And now we have yet another example of an embedded figure because again, we're cutting this way. And as we cut this way, what we uh, uh, start to intersect with is that oblique portion of the brain. So what I want you to do is look at things that you would not ordinarily expect. Number one, what type of tissue is this? The type of tissue you have here is cerebellar tissue. And what 
what uh, the cerebellum is the roof of a part of the ventricles. Here is the fourth ventricle. Now looking from here and just follow my outline. We come here, 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 and we come here. You see this, this whole area in here? It's an upside down midbrain, simply because, uh, again, the way the horizontal section is taking, uh, you're having the front part of the horizontal section intersecting with what? The ventral part of that midbrain and the more caudal part of that horizontal section would be uh, with the uh, superior surface of the midbrain. So here is the superior colliculi. Here is the periaqueductal gray. Here is the cerebral aqueduct. Around here is the red nuclei. Whoop. Here is the substantia nigra. And here is the cerebral peduncle. Then as we go forward, because as we go rostral here, going this way, we now see the mammillary bodies and the third ventricle. Let's see some other, other things that we can basically see here. Number 29 would be uh, the uh, uh, medial basal hypothalamus, like the area of substantia nominata, uh, arcuate nucleus, and things like that. And then number 32, seen out of here, we are so deep that we can see the anterior cerebral artery. Then lateral to this, uh, this embedded uh, midbrain figure, we can see on the uh, uh, medial temporal lobes, the hippocampi. So now we get down to, all the way down to the bottom. Whoop, went the wrong way. And I hope by now, you can now see a very well embedded figure of an upside down midbrain right here. You can see a much, you can see a fourth ventricle. You can see an embedded part of the cerebellum. And then in the temporal lobes, deep in the medial temporal lobes, you have the hippocampus, but if you were to follow that, hip, uh, follow that hippocampus forward, you come to another deep limbic nuclear, nucleus in the temporal lobe, medial temporal lobe, the amygdala. So here is the amygdala, here is the hippocampus, here is cerebellum, here is fourth ventricle, here are colliculi, I can't tell you which one. Here's periaqueductal gray. Here's cerebral aqueduct. Here's substantia nigra. Here's medial lemniscus. Here is cerebral peduncle. And then forward of that, what do we see here? We see the mammillary bodies, third ventricle, medial basal hypothalamus. And again, uh, the uh, deep down is the anterior cerebral artery.
So um, I'm hoping that you uh, are seeing here with again, H7 and H6, while giving us very nice little pictures of the midbrain that we have been seeing before, uh, uh, you know, it's a very interesting thing of showing that a, a, a plane of section that is supposed to be uh, parallel, once you get too deep, it doesn't show very much. And then we saw that H1 and H, uh, H1 and H2 didn't have that much information. So H3, H4, and H5 have an enormous amount of information. Now, I'm going to indicate to you something that I think is very important. What I think is the most important thing that I can teach you is to be able to recognize structures quite easily, whether you're looking at the structure coronally or whether you're looking at the structure horizontally. So therefore, when you come into this exam and you have part one, uh, and you have the first 40 questions, okay? Those first 40 questions, what you should be expecting is 40 unique questions about structures in the medulla, in the pons, and in the midbrain, okay? Then when you go to the next 40 questions, questions 41 to 80 on part one, which are those coronal sections, you should be expecting 40 somewhat unique questions or 40 unique answers there. So, so those first 80 questions are going to yield 80 unique answers. If you, all of a sudden you find yourself saying a structure over and over again, you know. Uh, you're not in the right ballpark. But now we come to number 81 to 95. I told you I'd give 15 horizontal questions. The structures I'm going to ask you and point to almost invariably will be found in the first, especially 41 through 80. But what I'm asking you to now to do is recognize that structure in a different plane of section. So let's just take an example. Let's take a big fat structure that you saw in coronal sections and you see in horizontal sections. Don't be surprised that somewhere between questions 41 and 80, one of the answers is putamen, okay? I'm not shocking anybody here. But then you can almost bet that somewhere among questions 81 to 95, the answer putamen will jump up again. So I always like to talk about that movie, The Usual Suspects, where we round, and Casablanca round up the usual suspects. Here, what I'm really trying to do is integrate what you've learned about identifying coronal sections with those of horizontal sections. So in probably over two thirds of the answers on the horizontal sections will be answers that you answered previously on the uh, coronal sections. Does everybody understand that? And, and that's where I'm really trying to, you know, so you're able to put these two things together. So now it's very interesting that if you ever went, if you went back to um, uh, when we went to gross, gross neuroanatomy and we looked at the superior surface of the brain and we looked at the lateral surface of the brain, we didn't learn very much. You know, uh, you know we learned about gyri and sulci. When we went to the inferior surface of the brain, we learned a lot. We learned about encephalic development. We learned about the cranial nerves. And then we learned about um, uh, all of the individual structures. And 
And that was a, a highly uh, useful section to introduce us to the brain. The next most highly useful section that we uh, did is looking at a medial surface of the brain or a mid-sagittal cut. And so when we were identifying things like the cingular gyrus and the corpus callosum and uh, the fornix and the thalamus, et cetera, et cetera, we could identify a lot there. So what this sort of argues to you is, gee, shouldn't the sagittal sections of the brain, as we slice mid-sagittally and then parasagittally, should they be giving us a lot more information than maybe horizontal sections or coronal sections? And in my estimation, they don't. And you're gonna see that here. And that is why I'm only asking five questions because I asked some of these questions already on part one of the first exam with the mid-sagittal cuts, right? So I know you know some things. So now I'm going to focus on this. Now, notice how I did this before. I uh, With coronal, we went rostral all the way to caudal. From uh, horizontal, we went from most superior all the way down to inferior. From sagittal, you would say I'd start on the lateral surface and work inward. And indeed, the sections I show you are called S1 to S7. However, if I showed you S1, the first thing you look at, you go, I don't know where the hell I am because I'm way out parasagittally. So therefore, the way I'm presenting uh, the sagittal sections is in inverse order. We're going to our old friend, the mid-sagittal section and working out. So, So here is literally a very close to a mid-sagittal section. Okay. So of course, when we did this before, and if you go back to your, all the way back to lecture one and look at the, you don't see it as uh, dramatic, but of course, what do we pay attention to before was our friend, the cingular gyrus. We then paid attention uh, to uh, 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 the, the corpus callosum. We paid attention to the lateral ventricle. And we don't see that here because this is slightly off mid-sagittal. Here's a little bit of the fornix. So now we're paying a lot more attention to the areas here. So let's look at what we have in S7. So, uh, the first thing we have is if we look into the thalamus here, we can see the dorsomedial uh, nuclei of the thalamus. And then we can see very nicely encapsulated is the AV nucleus of thalamus with the, the uh, intermedullary lamina of the thalamus. Then, then what we see is uh, number 20 is the ventral anterior uh, uh, nucleus uh, of the thalamus, okay, in here, and caudal thalamic nuclei. Then what we see is uh, a whole bunch of the fibers and uh, of uh, in, in the hypothalamus. So the one thing that we can see very clearly here is the uh, optic nerve and optic tract. And we can see uh, the whole area around the pituitary.
And then what we can see up in here is the head of the chordate nucleus as we look through the lateral ventricle. Then uh, we see the uh, cerebral peduncle here. And then we see both the medial lemniscus and corticospinal tract coursing through here. We then have the pyramids here. And then we have uh, pontine, medullary, and midbrain nuclei that are not very, very well defined. One thing that is extremely well defined here, however, is what we can see here of the two-way superior cerebellar peduncle, uh, moving from the cerebellum and then moving forward into forebrain structures. Okay, we have the calcarine fissure right here. And and the other thing we can see right here is the columns of the fornix. So those are the structures we see for mid uh, uh, or near mid sagittal. Now we're moving laterally. So a major thing here now is we are seeing the internal capsule going into the cerebral peduncle. We're seeing the medial lemniscus. And the medial lemniscus, uh, excuse me, this is the cerebral peduncle. Here's the medial lemniscus. Here's the substantia nigra. We're now off of the midline. We still can see the lateral portion of the AV nucleus of thalamus. And we can see the dorsomedial nucleus of thalamus. This again is still the chordate. And now what we can see is the, because we are lateral, here is the anterior commissure as it's coming towards its decussation. We can see the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum. Remember, they are more lateral. And what you see here are clear, uh, classic reticular formation. And here we can see the decussation of the pyramids. But again, it's not very, very sharp and clear. Now we go uh, 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 more lateral. So again, we see a very clearly uh, uh, demarcated um, uh, uh, dentate nucleus of the cerebellum. We can see very clear calcarin sulcus. We see the superior cerebellar peduncle. We see the medial lemniscus. And now what you can uh, basically see in the 
in the um, uh, in the thalamus is still can see an AV nucleus of thalamus. We now can see a rather large BPL nucleus of thalamus. And then we see behind the BPL nucleus of thalamus, the medial geniculate body. And then behind the, the another accessory thalamic nucleus, the pulvinar. And you still can see the chordae. Another interesting area that you can see out here is the nucleus basalis of Maynard, which of course is the source of the cholinergic um, cells that innovate the rest of the cortex and has been implicated in the etiology of Alzheimer's disease. So now we go to sagittal four. So now what starts to uh, uh, dominate in here is no, uh, here we are now lateral. So we see the putamen. We can see parts of the globus pallidus. We can see the anterior commissure as it's going more and more laterally. In the thalamus, we still have the BPL thalamus out here. And we have a lateral piece of the pulvinar right here. Now, all along here, we are seeing hippocampus in the medial temporal lobe. Okay, so now I move even more laterally. Okay, so you got one big structure out there that is sort of sitting out here looking like a whale. And of course, that's our friend of putamen. So you can see how lateral we are. What we don't see in here is any more globus pallidus because that's uh, too medial. And then what you're seeing in 14 and 15 is the hippocampus and enterrhinal cortex. And with 10, you're seeing the posterior and inferior horns of the lateral ventricle. So what you're basically seeing there is on the lateral surface, you're seeing some hippocampus and then uh, the, uh, to, uh, the, the lateral ventricle. There really isn't that much more uh, where I would point to something and say, see, this is a landmark here. We're trying to identify landmarks and we're losing them. So now look at what we have, external capsule, posterior horn of lateral ventricle, tail of the chordate, 
inferior horn of lateral ventricle and claustrum. Let's go and see. Here is the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle. Here is the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. And number eight, lateral to that as we look through the lateral ventricle, what do we see? The tail of the chordate, right? And then here we are, uh, here we have the external capsule. And then here we can see claustrum because we're so far out, they're not seeing uh, uh, the putamen anymore. And let me see if there's anything else I want to identify. No. Now look at this. Primary visual cortex, tail of chordate, insula, and lateral sulcus. So here, we're way out here. We have the lateral sulcus. Then number 14, uh, encapsulated by the lateral sulcus, the two uh, things is the insula. Number 11, remember we had lateral ventricles sitting out here. Now what do we have? We have one big long tail of a chordate. Not that you would identify it clearly as that, but that's what it is. And back here is primary visual cortex surrounding the calcarin sulcus. So, So I have at this point, uh, again, when we're looking at this, where are the questions going to come from? They're primarily going to come from uh, S7, S6, and S5. There might be a question or two from S3 and beyond. But the bulk of the five questions will come from there. And what am I going to focus on again? It's just like in the horizontal sections, I told you the majority of the questions are going to be, quote, do-overs of the coronal. The sections and the five questions, they're going to be do-overs of the coronal again showing that you can identify structures in two or three different planes of section. And of course, the structures I'm going to be pointing at are going to be important structures. Uh, I'm not the guy who gives a multiple choice exam. And the question is from footnote number seven of table 28. I hate those people. <laughs> The reason it's footnote number seven of table 28 is that probably the thing is not that important, but yet loads of our people that teach um, introductory biology to people feel that that is their uh, God-given uh, things and in, in, in things. I'm trying to teach you things that you can carry way into the future. So do you have any final questions about the coronal sections, the horizontal sections, and the sagittal sections. And by the way, the way I've taught this, uh, I've done this very deliberately, is uh, uh, I have two ways of teaching things. I can teach things in called something called mass practice, or I can teach it separately along the term. Earlier when I was teaching this course, I teach them separately, but then I would find the whole bunch of students would forget. Uh, by the time I got to the horizontal sections, two lectures later, they forgot about the coronal sections. That's why I bundle these things together. And that's basically how you do it. Now, I'm hoping, and I tried to put a, quite a bit of work into this, uh, 
in revising these three lectures so that that initial slide basically tells you, here's the names of the structures and here's the numbers, and then go and look at that. I don't want you to study it that way though. If you notice that when I went to the slide, in many cases, I tried to cover things in a thematic kind of way, like the thalamus, like the basal ganglia, uh, like uh, fiber tracts, et cetera, et cetera. So, but you can switch back and forth be, uh, between those two approaches. Okay. So folks don't have anybody of any, so what I'm going to basically going to do, this is the end of anything that has to do with part one. So uh, when, so don't be surprised, and there might be some of you who feel like you really know this, so you're really focusing on this. Um, there'll be some available dates that come before our next makeup meeting in which you can take part one of the exam on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So if you feel comfortable there, go and take the exam then, and then you can sort of split these things out. Otherwise, I have a series of dates that go from the 7th of December, Monday, through uh, Friday, the 18th of December, obviously not weekends, obviously in the middle of the day, okay? So that's what we're gonna be doing um, with that. So now, so now what I'm going to do is I have uh, about a half an hour. I'm now gonna start to go into uh, the lectures on, uh, the cortex. And the cerebellum. So here we go. So again, as we first found with the hippocampus, and as we're going to find again with uh, the cerebellum, there is a marked difference in cortical cells versus a lot of subcortical cells, in which I tried to point out before, when we look at subcortical cells, we look at the cell, and then we look at the dendritic fields and the soma for input. Then, of course, the axon hillock for, um, for integration, and then uh, where the axon goes, the projections, is the output. With the hippocampus, especially with the cortex, and also with the cerebellum, what we basically see are layers. And the layers have different types of functions. So, we're, and uh, Obviously, when you're looking at the uh, a human, and by the way, this is a simplified version of the human, that what you can basically see is, uh, uh, you can see six layers, but of course in here, you can divide the six layers into seven because you divide uh, uh, 6A and 6B away, but then you can go and subdivide it further so you have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 different layers that are cytoarchitectural. And what you basically can see here is um, the outputs coming out of the cere uh, out of the cortex is coming out of layer six. And that the and the, that this is going to the thalamus, and it's going to other areas of the cortex, and of course it's going, uh, as we saw with the basal ganglia, going to striatal structures. Then uh, what we basically see is that uh, in the thalamus lecture, is we saw many instances of the specific thalamic nuclei 
feeding into uh, into the um, in, in, into layers one and two. And the other areas of the cortex feed into layers one and two. But there are also thalamic inputs that go into layers uh, six, five, and four. So there is a lot of interesting integration as to how the things go. So the important thing of looking in general about cortical layers is that we're at, uh, are you going to see that layers one and two and four are going to be getting lots of input. Then layers three and five are going to be doing the integration. And then layer six is going to be getting uh, doing all kinds of output, but getting feedback uh, input from the thalamus. So the person who divided these sort of layers was Bon Economo, and he came up with these six layers that you could then see can get subdivided to 15 or more. The, out, the most uh, outer layer of the cortex, and that's how we're talking about this. So we're looking, we're looking at the most superficial layer closest to the pia matter uh, around the cortex would be the outer layer. And sometimes you curve underneath like the transverse gyrus. So, so now you're inferior. Where is the outer layer? The outer layer is the one that's most ventral. You understand that you keep, and it's the same kind of thing with the hippocampus. So layer one is called the plexiform layer or the molecular or zonal lamina, okay? Layer two is called the external granular layer. And granular, because the cells are incredibly small, they literally look like sand. Okay, tiny little bits of sand. Then layer three is the pyramidal layer, otherwise known as the external pyramidal lamina. Now we move from the granular layer with extremely tiny cells to the pyramidal layer where a large number of the cells are pyramid shaped cells. And the most typical type of pyramid shaped cells is sort of shaped like an inverse pyramid. So the base of the pyramid will appear superficially. The point of the pyramid is pointing deeper. So what is coming out of uh, the base of the pyramid with a number of these inverse pyramidal cells? What they have is an apical dendrite, a dendrite that comes up and out. Now, everything you've probably learned about neurons basically always uh, show you as the quote representative neuron, uh, the, the biggest process that comes off of a soma in a Psych 101 class, of course, is an axon. The point of the matter, however, when we look at the pyramidal layer, the external pyramidal layer and later the internal pyramidal layer with these uh, inverse pyramidal cells, otherwise known as BETS cells, B-E-T-Z, is they have an apical dendrite, which is uh, the thickest uh, uh, thing. And it's literally like a tree coming up with branches coming off. So what you have are dendritic branches, that's why they're called that. And then you have dendritic nodes, et cetera, and twigs coming off and whatever. So what, what it almost is, is if you went back to um, New York around 1960 and you looked, you looked out across the uh, landscape of New York and looked at the roofs, what you would basically see that you hardly ever see today is a bunch of antennae coming uh, up on the roof and it was connected to everybody's television set 
And the bigger your antenna, the better uh, 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 input that you're getting. That's how you get the input. So think of these uh, 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 pyramidal dendrites uh, going up out of the external pyramidal lamina in lamina three, going up into lamina two, and then the internal pyramidal lamina, ganglionic layer, the BET cells coming out of that, going into layer four and elaborating and getting all kinds of inputs from lamina two and lamina four, those external and internal granular layers, okay? So you can see granular is more input, uh, pyramidal is more output, okay? So you then have the, the internal granular layer, the ganglionic layer, and then the multiform layer, which is the fusiform lamina, which has fibers leaving the axons, which are puny when compared to the apical dendrite of those pyramidal cells. But then you also have thalamic inputs coming in, in layer six. Uh, so you have a two-way street with that multiform layer of mostly incoming and outgoing fibers. So here is exactly what I'm talking about. Here's a pyramidal cell. And this pyramidal cell is not in inverse, but it's a upright pyramidal cell. About 30 or 40% of the pyramidal cells are upright pyramids. The vast majority are inverse. Josh Brumberg can tell you things, a million things as to what the differences are. But look at, if you're basically looking at the process, look at that apical dendrite going through lam lamina three into lamina two or going out of lamina five into lamina four. And then you have these dendritic branches with gemmules, with nodes, with whatever. And there are these places. And of course, what's in here is another interesting thing called the extracellular matrix. Again, something that Josh Brumberg can talk about from now until doomsday. Now you do see some other processes of, of the pyramidal cell, which are dendritic, but the major one is the apical dendrite. Now look at this. Here is a pyramidal cell that is basically gonna send cortical output and it sends it through a rather puny looking axon when you compare it to the dendrites. So here are, uh, uh, and there's a, a whole bunch of, of, uh, of types of cells. So in here, where we're looking more in lamina two and lamina four and lamina six, we have what are called uh, cortical stellate cells. In these kinds of things, and you can see there's a uh, whole bunches of uh, different varieties some, uh, whereas the pyramidal cell gets its major inputs from that apical dendrite, okay? And that's gonna be a major output. These stellate cells are far more uh, bushy types of cells rather than tree-like, okay? Where uh, you might have uh, all the dendritic processes coming off and whatever, and they're really acting in clear ways as interneurons, and they are modulated by other output and they in turn modulate other output. And then what you have is uh, 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 other types of things that you, when, if you wanna go and you wanna divide things into two classes, you have what are called spiny neurons and non-spiny neurons in the cortex. And the best example of a spiny neuron is our friend, the pyramidal cell with the big long apical dendrite that dominates and a thinner sort of axon. And then the non-spiny have an enormous number of uh, interesting things. So there are things called chandelier cells. You know, they sort of come out in the thing and they sort of uh, 
uh, branch out and uh, get lots of uh, input or uh, a neurogliaform cell, sort of a bunch like that. And then um, uh, what is, uh, then you have uh, baskets and, and uh, things like that. Notice one other major thing between the spiny neurons and the non-spiny neurons. It's their chemical signature. More often than not, and when I say more often than not, I'm saying probably in about 90% of the cases, the uh, spiny cortical neurons employ a single amino acid neurotransmitter. And that is an excitatory neurotransmitter, glutamate. And of course, then has the neurophysiological sign uh, signature of activation, of depolarization, of all of the things that these cortical cells are firing. And notice these cells, the spiny cells, are exiting the cortex and going somewhere else, and in essence, doing what you always think about uh, cortical cells being doing, executive functioning, dictating, do this, do that, do the other thing, fire, fire, activate, when I tell you, okay? But then if we then look at the other class, the non-spiny neurons, the non-spiny neurons that are found in one, two, four, and six, they are more often than not, those interneurons, GABAergic, where they are producing uh, inhibition. And of course, this becomes important because uh, sometimes you're getting inputs of the spiny neurons and you want to focus that sharp or sharpen that. So what may happen is the spiny neurons, in addition to sending outputs beyond the cortex, also innovate surrounding cortical cells that then will uh, that will uh, excite an inhibitory cell to inhibit its neighbor. And what you then do is you start to get that sharpening of the things that we saw with Kuffler in the visual system. And Mount Castle would see this type of stuff uh, with the um, with the somatosensory system. So th what there is, is this columnar organization. Yes, you have layers one to six, but then uh, the cells in the cortex, as you go across the gyri or even within the gyri, you have a columnar organization. So what are the two wonderful examples that we see of the columnar organization? And that is in the pre-central gyrus and the post-central gyrus, so that uh, positioning, moving from the interhemispheric fissure, moving along the ladder, uh, moving along the superior surface, out to the lateral surface, out to the lateral sulcus, what you basically have in the precentral gyrus and postcentral gyrus is this sort of upside down homunculus or representation of somatosensory and motor control so that the toes are closest to the midline and the head is uh, furthest uh, uh, lateral out on uh, uh, the lateral surface close to the lateral sulcus. So you have this control and you're looking at laminae uh, three and, uh, uh, and uh, five. And then two and four are then communicating uh, across the columns. So you can again, Sharpen things. Hold on a second, please. Damn it. It was it was a delivery guy. That's what happens when you're doing it at home. Okay. Uh so in any case, uh, there you have um, uh, this organization. And of course, the thing that you see this with that we talked about earlier is the visual columnar organization of inputs of the left eye and the right eye. 
and uh, the blobs and orientation columns, and then that classic Nobel Prize winning um, a series of studies by Jubel and Weasel, where you occlude uh, 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 one eye of an infant kitten. And then when you remove the occlusion uh, after the critical period, you notice that the animal is functionally blind in one eye simply because um, the, uh, uh, the spreading inhibition and collateral inhibition was not at work there. And here you can see the beautiful columnar organization of, uh, of, the, uh, 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 you know, of the visual cortex. So what you can see are these pyramidal cells with their elaborate apical dendrites reaching over and getting innovation from a large area that overlap with one another, but you can basically see if this was the area that was getting the maximal stimulation, this cell might fire and then uh, reciprocally inhibit these cells, just like you do it at earlier points in the visual system with the horizontal cells at the bipolar level and the amacrine cells at the ganglion level. Okay, so now there's another kind of question I have here. And that is when we look at these cortical layers Von Economo, that when you basically look across the brain and you look at the, uh, the relative thicknesses of the six layers, whether you're in the frontal cortex or you're in the temporal cortex, or you're in the occipital cortex, the relative thicknesses of layer one and layer two, of course, layer three is bigger, layer four, layer five, layer six. So, uh, you know, um, uh, they're, they're relative, you, relatively uniform. So what that is called is homotypical cortex, okay? That, that the layers are pretty uniform across all of the lobes. But there, is, there are two examples of what is called heterotypical cortex. And by heterotypical cortex, what we are basically saying is even though the, uh, the total thickness is roughly the same of the cortex, that there's gonna be more of a couple of types of layers and, le and correspondingly less of another type of layers in these two heterotypical areas. Now, armed with the uh, armed with all of the information uh, that I've given you in this course, um, let me go. Uh, I'd like I'd like to see people <laughs> if you can put yourselves on. Okay, what I want you to do is here's a thought question. You have homotypical cortex and heterotypical cortex. I gave you the two examples of heterotypical cortex all the way back in lecture one. Can you name somewhere on the superior and lateral surfaces of the cortex what two gyri or heterotypical cortex, and then why and how? So let's go through the things. We have superior frontal gyrus, middle frontal gyrus, inferior frontal gyrus. We have superior parietal lobule, inferior parietal lobule, primary visual cortex, superior temporal gyrus, middle temporal gyrus, inferior temporal gyrus, parahippocampal gyrus. Are any of those, do you think any of those are heterotypical cortex? By heterotypical, you mean that they project into multiple different places, right? No, Not that they, have, that they have differential thicknesses from all of the others. What I just did there 
is I gave you many different gyri in the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe that are beautiful examples of homotypical cortex. I left two mm -hmm. gyri out. What were the two gyri I left out? Oh, Three God. Five minutes, it's almost no. 12 o'clock. I'm <laughs> dying. Go ahead. Annalise. Was it the pre-central and post-central gyri? Oh, my God. You hit it. Okay. Very good. <laughs> so now, what's, let's go all the way back to lecture one. The precentral gyrus is otherwise functionally known as motor cortex. Primary motor cortex. So what would there be more of in the laminae and what would be less of in the precentral gyrus? Motor is what? Movement, right? And the activation is what? I want you to move and move now. That's how people think of executive function, right? The uh, controller, every, everything you ever read about the thing, this is why this is thought this way. So which layers would be thicker in the precentral gyrus? You have six layers. Which layers would be thicker? Somebody. Two of the layers will be thicker. Two of the layers will be thinner. Would uh, three and four be thicker in the precentral? You're very close. Three and five. That's why you memorize the Ivanikanamo layers. What are they? They are the external pyramidal layer and the internal pyramidal layer, otherwise known as the pyramidal lamina and the ganglionic lamina, okay? Those are the motor, motor cells. What is thinner in a precentral gyrus? If, the, if three and five are thicker, which two layers are thinner? Two and four. Two and four. Remember, two and four were those little sand-like granular layers, which are what? Uh, integrative sensory type, you know, just little pieces of information, okay? So, so the precentral gyrus is homo is heterotypical cortex because it has more of three and five and less than two or four, okay? So now somebody else has to be on the chopping block. Now let's go to our friend, the postcentral gyrus. What is the name of the postcentral gyrus? What is the functional name of the postcentral gyrus? Somebody, come on, unmute yourselves and make the a guess. Motor, the motor cortex. The what? Primary motor cortex. No, no, no. That's the precentral gyrus. Primary the somatosensory cortex. Primary somatosensory um, cortex. So what's coming in? What's the important thing? It's the inputs that are coming in here, aren't they? It's That's why it's called somatosensory. We're trying to figure out where in the goddamn body is getting stimulated, right? So now, which layers of po uh, post-central gyrus w w would be thicker? Layers two and four. Layers two and four, because those are those little... Uh, 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 little granule cells that are all these inputs coming into it, right? And what would be less? Wh which would be thinner? Three and five. Three and five. So there you go. So, so not only did we have this cortical elaboration of these six layers, but we actually specialized two of the gyri that really went into all of the function because let's face it, the, uh, the somatosensory cortex and the motor cortex are there for one reason. One's an input, tell me, tell me what came in and the other's the output 
And now all of a sudden the layers evolutionarily changed in terms of importance. Okay, so that's what we uh, 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 basically seeing uh, with the cortex. Now, somebody might say, gee, I'm expecting another 20 lectures on the cortex. You can now take that very simple kind of structure with all of these things and then take it to all of the functional things that you learn about the cortex in all of your other uh, cord uh, uh, courses with cortical function. So I think, yes, there we are. We're at 1156. So what I'm doing is giving you four minutes off, but very good. This is the sort of exercise. One of the things I can't help but just beg you to do is you've now, I hope in this course, you've been armed with an enormous amount of information that you can always go back to and you can always refresh. And then you want to start to ask the questions, why and why is it this way? How can we use it and things like that? And that's the thing in virtually any area of, of, uh, of work that you are interested in, you can bring this type of questioning to bear, okay? So what you're gonna be getting in, in the next day or so, so have a whole bunch of other things to do, is this sort of big schedule as to when you can take part one. You've all now been armed with part two, the general groups of the questions, you can start working on that. And with the part one, you should now then allocate your time and think, when do you wanna take that exam and put your prioritized things and it's first come first serve. And I will then schedule people. And then you'll do those two things. And then finally also hand in um, uh, the paper and then you'll be done with me. Okay, so we'll have that makeup class uh, next Thursday at, uh, at nine o'clock. I'll be sending you the Zoom invite and sending you the Zoom invites for all of your uh, individual scheduling on part one. So have a uh, good week. You're into a very busy time and hopefully uh, we'll sort of put all of this together in one big package. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. Bye. See you, Dr. Bye. Thank you. Bye.